this webinar is all about uh, creative ways, different ways of doing worship or worship-ish, basically pastoral care, keeping that connection going with our uh, congregation and community in this time of social distancing, uh, but specifically with uh, communities or people that are not comfortable with or just don't have access to the internet. Um, with that, I'm going to start with a note from uh, Dave McPherson, Reverend David, David McPherson. He's the director of New and Vital Faith for the Desert Southwest Conference. Um, so as we go along in this webinar, uh, he cautions us, let's be mindful, be careful that our assumptions of um, people aren't, my people aren't online, or I've got an older congregation, so they don't have access, they don't, they're not comfortable. He's just uh, reminding us that ageism, it's, you know, it's a real thing, but many grandparents have been using Facebook for years and, you know, connected with their grandkids. So to make the assumption that because my congregation is older, um, they're not online, it's not necessarily true. So we need to be careful to um, actually do some kind of a survey, find out who really is connected, who isn't. And, uh, and if it's just a preference that they don't want to use the internet, we can be respectful of that, but also respectfully ask them, I totally understand, but at this time, trying to stay connected in this way, do you want to give it a try? You know, and if not, then hopefully some of these ideas that we get today uh, will help bridge that gap and, and make sure that everybody is feeling that comfort and love of community, of God, uh, feeling that hope, and, and we're all able to provide that for um, our anxious people. Uh, all right, so Tom Jelinek, thank you very much for joining us today and, and agreeing to be a panelist. Uh, Tom is in Patagonia. He says some of our residents have little or no internet access um, or interest in having it, right? So uh, he's working to get worship on um, their local 25 watt Patagonia radio st station. That I have to admit, I did not quite follow, but it sounded interesting, very unique. So if you can tell us about that idea. Go ahead. Sure, sure. Um, it, and may I, before I begin, I just like to say this is a circumstance that I'm sorry to say, is probably not available to a lot of communities. Uh, but in Patagonia, we have one radio station, which is a community station. It's a 25 watt FM station. And it covers the Patagonia community and on a real good day, maybe 10 miles in, in either direction. But uh, the Patagonia is a very small community. It's about 900 people. And uh, the owner of this station it is a very strong commitment to serving the community. So I contacted him, uh, explaining to him our current situation of that we will not be able to offer uh, in-person worship for the next several weeks at least. And, uh, and he agreed that that would be a good use of the local airtime. So we will be, uh, hopefully by this Sunday, uh, offering a uh, radio worship service on Sunday morning. And how that will be created is, um, and I think we can dovetail a little bit with some of the things that were discussed yesterday, uh, we, I, uh, our accompanist, uh, possibly our choir director, and uh, maybe one or two, will be um, in, in our sanctuary, uh, and we will record, pre-record, an abbreviated form of our worship service with a um, uh, with a hymn at the beginning, prayer, scripture reading. Uh, one element that we'll, we'll use will be to email the congregation 
and ask them if they have any prayer requests for the week and to ask them to email those into us by, say, Saturday if they would like them lifted up in the service. And then, of course, we'll have, we'll have scriptures, uh, sermon, and uh, closing music. And so while it won't be, uh, it won't have the element of intimacy that one would have with in-person worship, uh, it will be something that will keep a connection with our congregation. And if, if I might say, it will be extremely easy to construct and to offer. We'll, be, we'll just you know, go through and pre-record it if there are little you know, mistakes or slips here and there. It's, it won't be something that we'll stop and redo. In other words, just like you were there on a Sunday morning. And uh, and give that sense of of reality. So um, that is the plan, and uh, would would certainly uh, welcome any any questions or things that folks might have at this point. Uh, hey, what yeah, I've go got ahead. one here. Yep. What kind of equipment do you need to record for radio? Excellent question. Um, what we are going to do is use the soundboard uh, for, the, uh, for our sanctuary sound system. And we'll figure out which works better. We have a little uh, standalone recorder, which one can get online, I believe, for less than $100. Um, and if, if that doesn't work, to the satisfaction that we hope it will, then most laptops have an input for a microphone. And we will use that, run that through the soundboard. We may need to have um, some sort of um, special adapter for that to bring the, the level from the soundboard down to that microphone uh, input. But, uh, one way or the other, we'll simply uh, create an MP3 file, which is the standard format for audio files. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then put that onto a jump drive and give that to the radio station. And they'll be able to upload it and, uh, and air, air that on Sunday morning. Great. So then if I, I can't see this being a possibility, but what the heck, why not reach out? Whether you're in a small community, that's where I was thinking this makes sense. Like you said, you've got a, one radio station, so it's a lot more likely that they'll do something. But why not reach out to local uh, radio stations, right? Start making those connections, introduce yourself. Um, they may not take you up on this worship online or worship via radio. Uh, request, but at least you've made a connection and you might be able to share some resources down the road, right? Absolutely. Now, I know, and I, I, I know that some radio stations now, by virtue of HD radio, have substations. And I have no idea what stations uh, within the bounds of our conference have that or what of those, <clears throat> excuse me, of those stations might be willing to offer airtime for, for a worship service. But uh, that's certainly something that's uh, worth pursuing in case the main station, the, you know, the, the FM or AM station is not willing to do that. I see Bob's hand. I, I, just to add, Tom, um, in smaller rural areas, uh, this would work perfect uh, for less than $100. You can get an FM radio transmitter 
and you can transmit your own radio station without an FCC license. Yes, but the power of those unlicensed stations is typically about a tenth of a watt. Actually, uh, we just bought we just bought a five watt FM transmitter for seventy dollars. Really? And I've already been in contact with the FCC, and um, you are allowed to use a two watt transmitter. Again, they're all adjustable, so we'll turn it down from uh, five watts down to two. Uh, two watts will get us up to a couple miles from the church, and uh, you can do that without a license. It's totally legal. Well, I stand corrected. You you have more current information than I have, so that's wonderful news. That's good. That's excellent. That's good to know. About, Is go ahead. Um, I was wondering. We have a question here about the kinds of licensing that's needed to play a hymn on the radio. I would assume that it's still a streaming license, but have you guys researched that? Yes. Um, there is a provision with the FCC in the copyright laws that's called transformative uh, uh, streaming, where if you're just going to play it for entertainment purposes, yes, you need the streaming copyright uh, licensing. However, there is a provision that's called transformative uh, um, streaming, where if you are going to editorialize or if you're going to use the uh, the streaming as an instructional uh, platform, you're you're permitted to do that. Um, my uh, office manager looked into this even further and found some examples of transformative uh, streaming. So, for example, um, this example showed uh, this gentleman uh, in front of his computer, and he was showing a music video. And just to show the music video, you obviously would need the streaming license. However, he's using this, this uh, music video to make a point. He was going on a discussion. He says, okay, now what I want you to do, I want you to listen to this song. See if this song has the same kind of message that we're talking about here. He played the music in the song and then came back on with the discussion again. See, the points are reinforced in this music. So it, it's not just a entertainment. It's actually mm -hmm. instructional. It's called transformative streaming okay so we'll look into that uh, a little further and see if we can add that to um, there's going to be more discussions next week and uh, we'll try to add some resources links documentation to show all of the licensing side of it and we do have a ccli video that we recorded yesterday it's available at the dscumc.org slash worship dash online uh, web page. Um, so we've got a, cup, a few more questions uh, and then we'll move on to the next segment. Uh, Linda's asking, how do I create an MP3 file? Tommy sounded so like, well, yeah, you just do this and this and done. <laughs> Easy. Well, it depends on the device that you're using. If you're using your laptop, typically either the laptop or a program that's a, an app that's in it, uh, such like uh, Windows Media Player or something, will have an option for recording. And you just follow the instructions there. And then once you're, once you're done with the recording, what you will have is an MP3 file. And you can name it, and then you can transfer it to a... Um, uh, uh, jump drive or you know however you want to you if it's not too large you can email it uh to the person that is going to be using it and um if if you're using google 
if you're using Gmail, for example, it has to be 25 meg or less, or else Gmail will not take it. Uh, and that may vary for Outlook or some other things. I'm really not sure. But in any event, um, so it depends on the device you're using. The little individual standalone recorder that we have, uh, I think the, the procedure is a little bit different, but again, it creates uh, MP3 files and then you can, um, with a cable, you can transfer those to a laptop or a, or a uh, desktop computer and then send them or whatever you want to do. All right, thanks, Tom. At this time, I want to bring everyone's attention to the chat part of it. If you're not already engaged there, um, Amy Calm just offered a great idea for or a link to what she uses to convert from an MP4 to an MP3. Uh, so stay tuned in there, continue the conversation. Uh, so I'm going to share some. Um, information or ideas that I received from Carla Whitmire, our East and West District Administrative Assistant. Um, you know, they're, they get to see what's going on in our churches much closer than I can. So Carla shared that Sarah Allen is having volunteers call every member to do health checks. And then she follows up with those to that have indicated that they needed a pastoral call. call. So I, I think that's a lot like the phone tree. You know, it's not necessarily that one person is calling everybody, but you divvy it up. And for our larger churches, it might be a little harder, but hey, recruit some more volunteers. Um, all right. So the second thing she has. Yeah, Tom. One thing that our church uses, and we, we did this long before uh, the coronavirus situation, uh, is something uh, called One Call Tell All, and there's a number of services like this. You simply record a message, it's about two minutes, and then you can send it to whoever is on that list. And there's a monthly fee uh, for the service, but we find that it works better than, say, a church newsletter or uh, you know, a number of other ways or email another, a number of other ways to distribute information for us. So that's a way that, uh, and we have used that extensively in the last week or two as the situation has developed. Awesome. So Carla continues saying, many pastors and staff are offering to do shopping for those that are ill or in the high risk category. Um, I heard from somebody else about using the Nextdoor app, so that's something else. Uh, one pastor last week emailed the text of his sermon and the bulletin to those who were not comfortable with attending. Brenda Smith at Paradise Valley already developed a number of things for the children in the congregation, and she's going to be sharing more about that on Wednesday's conversation. Uh, that's on March 25th, uh, and you can register for that conversation at dscumc.org slash worship dash online. It's a one hour conversation. Uh, and then finally, Carla recommends sending out an updated directory so people can connect to each other. You know, the more we can do connecting each other to each other and not necessarily funneling into just the pastor or just those volunteers, it's even better. It's, it's you know, it's relationships, right? We're, we're in this together. All right, so since we were talking about the uh, radio situation, um, I think our next speaker is going to be Bob Holliday, who's with us already. He's from Epworth UMC, um, and he's already finding success with a ham radio and using his sidewalk Sunday school setup. Sidewalk, come back, woo! All right, uh, Bob, tell us, tell us about that. I mean, how did the idea come about? And, uh, how are you able to run with it in this time of social distancing? Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I remember when I was a kid, I went to church with my aunt and uncle uh, back in New York, and it was a Catholic worship service, but they had uh, they had old drive-in movie theater speakers in their in their parking lot, and so people would drive into the church and then hang the the speaker on their car. Well, years later here in Tucson, uh, I, a very dear friend of mine, um, 
was the pastor of a uh, uh, church on, the, on uh, South Park Avenue. They also had a big field and had bought all of the uh, speakers from a, a drive-in theater that went out of business. And so they built a big uh, Ramada kind of platform. Uh, that was their, that was their uh, platform area for worship. And the pastor stood up there and, and used the microphones and, and it all went through these speakers. Well, those speakers are not very available much anymore. However, as we were talking, uh, it's very, very uh, easy to get a small wattage FM transmitter. In fact, many children's toys work off of these small FM speak, uh, transmitters where, you know, you can, uh, Mr. Microphone, you know, and you can hear it in your, in your living room. That's a small FM transmitter. So when I contacted the FCC, they said, oh yeah, so long as it's less than two watts, you can use that. Well, who, whose automobile does not have a radio in it? Almost everybody has a radio in their car. And so we thought, well, wait, there, we have a number of people that uh, in church this last week, I, I asked how many people are on Facebook and how many people have computers and how many people don't and how many, you know, so we did the survey kind of thing to make sure because we, wanna, we want to not just assume that everybody can go online. And we found a lot of people could not or 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 didn't feel comfortable so we thought well how can we do that and thanks to Billy we have one of the sidewalk Sunday school trucks here however when I was talking to United Methodist News Services uh, yesterday we also discussed how this could be done on a flatbed trailer in the back of a pickup truck it could be done where you have uh, some three quarter inch plywood and set it up on some uh, blocks, you know, to create a little stage. You could put a pop up canopy on it. There's all kinds of things to do to create a platform so people can drive into your parking lot. And then you have this uh, low wattage uh, FM transmitter. So we will be, uh, you know, W. UMC to, uh, on Sunday morning, you know, uh, transmitting our worship service live in the parking lot as people sit in their car and worship together. That's we'll, awesome. We'll play some music. Uh, we're going to honk for Jesus, you know, and, and just kind of make this uh, in a, a spirit filled experience, you know, that uh, we'll say a prayer. And if all the people say amen, beep your horn. So how about for the social distancing part? People are in their cars, but then your volunteers are coming over like communion, giving. How does that work? So social distancing, if you remember, you're not supposed to gather in groups of more than 10 or so. And I doubt whether there's going to be that many people in one car. And, you know, in terms of how we're going to do the um, the, the, the communion or that kind of thing. This last week we uh, practiced, uh, we, have a, we have a physician that is uh, on our covenant council who is very involved in our planning. And, and last week what we did is we had uh, the, the one person cut the communion bread into large squares. Our servers all wore gloves and the servers took the bread, dipped it in the cup, and then gave it to the person. So nobody touches the communion bread except the person receiving it because the servers all have gloves on. Great. So when the server is handing over the bread, they just drop it on the person's hand? Yep. So there's no connection. Wow, that's awesome. What about giving? And giving, we're going to have uh, a common giving area so that people can, as they drive in or they drive out, uh, are able to make their deposits in the, in the bucket like they do at toll booths. You know? I mean, there, there's, there's always a way. I read somewhere, there's a really, really good book that I read that says all things are possible. 
and and it's just finding finding those ways to be creative to make it possible because people still you know have that have that desire to be in community and not you know social distancing is distancing not disconnection thank right. you Sherry? so bob um you're, you still have somebody standing in front of them though. They're not six feet away as they give that out, correct? Well, you mean the, the servers? Okay, yes. Yeah, they will walk car to car. The people will not even get out of their car. And okay. we'll walk up to the car, to the window and hand them, hand them the, the, the elements in their car. We don't have to lean into the car. We don't have to open the door. You don't have to do anything. You just walk from car to car. Okay. Wow. All right. Um, so if additional questions pop up about this, oh, here's a question from Billy Fidlin. Did your servers wear masks, Bob? I know the droplets are an issue from cough or sneezes. They did not last week. Um, and we're talking about that this week. Perfect. It is a learning curve, um, and uh, hopefully, you know, as, as we share more, and, we get and better and better. One of the things that we're going to be doing simultaneously is we will also do live streaming video uh, on Facebook as we do our, our drive-in worship service. And, and as Billy and some of you have already known, we sent out a press release uh, earlier in the week to the major uh, news outlets. And um, so last night, uh, CBS had a story about us doing drive-in worship and Billy said she heard it this morning. I don't know what channel, but um, so yeah, we wanna connect with the people in the neighborhood and the community and let other people know that uh, there's still an opportunity to, to gather and respect each other's safe space. All right. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so please continue to type in your questions in the Q&A um, and uh, we'll keep looking at those as, as it's appropriate. We'll address them. Uh, so now I'm going to share some notes that were uh, provided from Reverend Dan Morley, our North District Superintendent. Uh, he shared, so number one, I understand that with our ethnic communities, um, some of them it's the gathering part is a critical component for worship and for that offering. It, it means something. And I don't know the exact definition of, of what it means, but um, you know, it's, it's a big deal. So this drive up worship is a great alternative to bring in groups of more than 10, uh, you know, but staying safe. Well, and, and Christina, we have, uh... We have a, a, a fairly large refugee uh, population and gathering is very important to them and many of them are not connected electronically. So this becomes very important. So here's something what, what um, Dan shared was a possibility that was submitted by one of our ethnic churches. It was Grace Phil AM. Uh, J.C. Salang Sang um, explained what Simba Hayan is, and I'm sorry if I'm not saying it right. Uh, it's a Filipino practice of family devotion. So they have short worship services at home as an alternative to a larger worship gathering. Uh, others prepare the lit liturgy and provide the short printed homily. Uh, and their pastor might also stop by their, the homes and do just the one family short worship. Uh, I could see where that would be next to impossible in a huge church, but perhaps in some of our smaller uh, worship settings, that, that's something that could happen. Um, and I understand, you know, there's still the issue of, well, bringing that one person to my home you know, they might be carriers, we might be carriers, so now we're transmitting it all over. Um, there's ways around that too, you know, whether it's that the pastor stays outside and is uh, 
maybe sharing, preaching, whatever from the window, you know, I don't know. Uh, just, yeah, but I know um, this particular church, that's what they practice. And they said it takes about 30 minutes and they provided the order of the family devotion. I'm going to share that real quick with you guys. Here it is. So here's how, how they go about it. And really, if you think about it, I know um, Reverend Beth Rambaker is working right now to receive a liturgy that was written by our clergy that is that are willing to go ahead and share that content um, copyright free uh, so that we can all have these resources at home. You could mail things like this to your um, congregation, include an offering envelope in there, and uh, then families could do their own worship service. Just another possibility. All right, let's move along. Um, all right, now our other panelist that we have with us right now, super lucky to have her with us, Sherry Hull. So she's joining us from Prescott UMC. And for those of you that don't know Sherry, uh, she volunteers at her church and at, with uh, conference communications. Her background is in communications and then some. Uh, she's retired now, but um, Sherry, I mean, I know when you worked for ADOT, you had a big challenge. You had to connect thousands of people train 777 people, right? So with your background in networking, mentoring, nonprofits, um, I'm sure you've got some great advice and ideas for churches during this challenging time. Could you share with us some of your thoughts? Sure, thanks. Um, I do take a different take on this. And if you look at it from the aspect of businesses that have um, satellite places that they have around the world or that they have within the United States, they're trying to engage their employees and the folks that are there in their, their culture and what they want to communicate and what they want to pull together. People generally and want to be part of a quote unquote tribe. They want to know that they're still part of that. They want to be engaged in what's going on. So as I listen to all this, I'm still hearing a lot of technology that's a part of this. And trust me, I'm one of the biggest technology geeks, you know, I'm, with a Q-tip head that there, that there is out there that I wanna, wanna be able to share that. But what I started looking at, and especially within my own church, um, looking at communication and was talking with Pastor Dan recently about com internal communication. You wanna engage people, you wanna keep pulling them back in and yes, pulling into a parking lot and doing that kind of thing will help to do that. But what if people don't have access or can't pull, you know, get in a car and pull over to be able to do that, to come to do that? So they don't, we don't want them to start feeling like they're gonna look, start looking for that service that's on television because that's all they have in terms of technology or that they're listening to the radio and that's where they're getting it. Because what happens is, and if I project this out, if I can find my worship service somewhere else, particularly in today's society, we're, we're all wanting to keep people coming back to church. But if, if I find that somewhere else, you know, why do I, why do I want to come back to this if I'm so disengaged from my church? You want to start with why in everything you look at. Why are we doing it like this? Why do we need to do something different? Start with why. People need to know their why. Why am I going to come back to this church? Why am I going to depend on them? And in this time of emergency, why, why do I want to, why am I there if I'm not engaged with anybody? Nobody calls me if I'm not a part of anything. So I start looking at it from old school. And I, I, wanna, I wanna be that uh, in a touch economy in the, where we're not supposed to touch each other. How much can we create that one-on-one -on -one person to do that? So I created this thing I was sitting and thinking through that. So what can I do that I've got Christ careers that are gonna be out there that we have, we create the committee within the church and I'm looking at my size of church, you know, where we've got you know, we're from four to 600 people that attend on a, on a weekend basis. So how can I get to them so that they're still feeling like they're a part of this? So if we create the team and you've got to have a communication person within each church, that is that person that spearheads that, not necessarily the person that does the newsletter, but somebody else that's completely focused on all aspects from a 35,000 foot view of how are all the things we're doing that's really communicating. If you have teams that are going out to these homes and they're taking the printed and because I don't know that these people have computers you could take them on a CD but maybe they don't have computers 
maybe what they have is the ability to read, you know, what comes in, in that, but it becomes a different kind of a newsletter then. So then you're asking, you want to give and take from that. So the Christ couriers that are out there then are picking up the prayer requests that are picking up the thoughts that they have. And the other thing you can start doing is thinking outside that with, what if I wanted to do a shout out? You know what, big shout out to Sam Smith that's been part of this, that's really been a part of it. Somebody that wants to be able to say something that's getting their communication out and it goes into print that gets handed out to all these places. If you had 10 to 12 to 20 couriers that switched it out every other week and hand delivered the, the sermon, the shout outs, the prayer requests, all those things that they are picking up and bringing back and it gets printed. Granted, it means that we all have to really get involved, but if we don't get involved, we're not working as a community. Bringing people together, looking for solutions to get out to the folks that can't necessarily get to that. We, are, we have streaming, certainly that's on Facebook. For anybody that can, can get to that, that's fantastic. But how many people do I have sitting there in that church? And I can look around easily and see plenty that I know they're not even signing up for the newsletter to come to them via email because they don't have email or because they look at their email once a month or once every three months. That's not how they communicate. You have to communicate the way people need to hear it, not the way you need to say it. You start looking at the introverts that are out there. You look at the folks and how they need to pull that in. Well, wouldn't you want to be a part of that? Creating a mentoring program among the folks that are within your church. You know what? If you take on three to five people that you're giving a call out to and talking with them, how are you making it through this? And what does it feel like to you? What's going through your mind? And having that conversation, not just of, and at the end of it, you have a prayer or you talk about where their needs are. You're able to communicate that back to the pastor then where they may not have picked up the phone and called the pastor where the pastor may be overwhelmed with what's coming into them, where they may be getting it all from somebody else. And it may, you know, maybe like telephone where it's gone through so many people that it's getting diluted before it gets there. So because we have the age group that we have within this, we have to go old school initially. You know, the Pony Express went around taking things and yeah, they didn't get the sermon probably within a month, but I think we can probably turn that around faster. There's plenty of us that are still driving that can get involved with this if that's set up as a team captain in communications, it's a whole new world in communications within that church um, and create that from a timing standpoint so that everybody feels like they're a part of getting this out to that when they're a part and they're communicating with the people, you know, leave it at the front door. There's a special box that they leave with them that they can drop that into. They use their, you know, the latex gloves to be able to do that and they pick that up and take it back because we all know it's riding on you know, every, all kind of surface that's out there. Because if not, if you're just doing it in terms of recording something and getting to them, it's a one-way conversation. You're not engaging people and pulling them into it. So a big piece of this is getting the, the congregation that's willing to participate and keep going back to them and saying, we need you so badly to be a part of this. They need to feel like they're doing something, not just showing up you know, someplace to hear what the sermon is. And I don't mean to diminish that, but pulling, really pulling out and being a part of the rest of the folks that are part of that congregation. So your print sermons, your prayer studies, your, you know, any kind of phone conferences, if it's, if somebody, you know, and certainly the survey is, is important with this. If these people folks want to get it as a CD, there's plenty of folks that still have CD players out there. Um, however, they want to be able to see that, but somebody has to spearhead this within the church rather than, oh yeah, the newsletter person can do that. Well, the newsletter person can't do that. They're still doing their mode of communication to do that. So yes, it can be mailed. You know, yeah, you can do that if that's what you wanna be able to do. But I think it's hugely important to keep bringing people back together because if they're not engaged in why they're a part of this church, why do I wanna still be here if I can get what I wanna get someplace else? And this is, I, I, I'm going to go back to a business development aspect of this because the reality is there's a great book, a couple of books out there that I shared recently with somebody else. It's called Selling the Invisible because the reality is it's what's in your heart. It's what's in your mind and it's where you feel like you're a part of this. You're, we're selling the invisible. If I can't tell you why I'm part of this, I'm going to start looking at something else. When you get to how I'm going to go about this, I'm going to go to church and and what I get there is good. And somebody says, well, why do you go to this one? And you can't answer that. I don't know, because it's close by, because it's, 
Because in times of like this, in times of stress, in times of things going on, you have to fall back to your why. Most organizations, a third of that organization, whatever it is, from not-for-profit to whatever, will stay if the walls fall down and everything else happens. I'm there because, well, you know what, I've been here 40 years, or I know why I'm here. The other two-thirds are fickle. So this is the time that we need to show up and show up in a way that nobody else is showing up. You know, the grocery store manager isn't coming to your front door, but they're figuring out a way to be able to deliver that to keep engaging you in that particular grocery store. What we have is, you know, if I could put Christ spirit into this and be able to say, it's this wonderful, bright, shiny thing, and I'm going to hand it off to you to hang on to. And this is why, because we're the only folks that can bring that to you. I want to keep bringing you in because I care about it. you need keep saying, you know, what gets communicated will bring people back to that. If I feel like you forgot me, if I feel like I'm only there to hand something in the plate to go by, if I don't know why I want to remain a part of that, it'll fall off. And what we don't want to see at the end, at when this finally, whatever plays out, is that there are a few people sitting in the pews because they figured out another way to be able to do that. We want to keep them coming back. And the best way is to show that. So a mentoring program, you know, the phone calls, we can show up at the front door with Christ Couriers and, and be able to exchange information. We can mail that to them. Um, they must feel a part of something bigger. That's my, you know, book reviews. On top of that, you know, what books are you reading? But putting it in there and you see, you know, when I sit next to Susie Q typically on the pew, and she just read this book and said, it's great. And I see that in what's coming to me. Then I might be willing to do that. What if your library is within your church? What if you were also delivering library books from your church for people that are in the hinterlands that you're out there doing that? That's another way to be able to be getting something back from that church to do that. So just that's my, my top level take on that. I think it fits into some of the other stuff that you guys are doing. I think I think all of it is, is required. I don't think there's one simple answer to any of it, but it's different times and you have to get really creative with it because there's so many other avenues that people can pick up on and realize that, wow, the local ch the church down the road from me checked on me and I'm not even a part of them. And that starts happening. We don't want to lose people in this process either. It's important that we stay together. And how can we show that? When your best friend says this is what they're doing, what do you do? You, you're the influencer. How can we be influencers for Christ within this to continue to be out there and provide what we have inside of us as a big heart and how much we care? That's my speech. <laughs> you're awesome, Sherry. Thank you so much. Well, you're so um, nice including me. Yeah, so we do have a question from Beth Rambaker, um, and it, she says, could you do this as an evangelism tool? Like, could I go to an apartment complex and do this kind of work and let people know that they're not alone? There's, are you talking about people coming down from their apartments to meet into the clubhouse? Or I'm No, I, I think what she's meaning is, um, and, and really, I guess it's a question for all of our participants that are listen, listening in and, and panelists. Um, you know, all the things that you're sharing about reaching out into the community, stay connected with your congregation, she's extending it out to being an evangelism tool, even for people that have not met us. Like, does that make sense for something like this? I get it. I'm sorry. It didn't ring there for a minute. I wasn't sure what, I wasn't picturing what she was wanting to do. So why not? Why not do that? Why not show up in places like that to be able to say, you know what, we just want to be able to include people to do this. I'll be back next week. I want to. I want to hear what prayer concerns are here. It doesn't mean they have to come to church with us, but I. We really actually care. What are you afraid of? Can you imagine if you're, you know, if you're by yourself and you're 70 years old and you don't have access to this and you're living in an apartment, and then then what happens if you've not been connected to a church and physically not able to do that? What? Yes, Beth, you bet your socks. That is. That is exactly. What we need to do is to be able to keep reaching out and pulling people in into our tribe. People want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. They want to feel like they're there with that. So why wouldn't that be the amazing thing? So let's get 
back into the um, how did you do this mode? Because I mean, these are great ideas. And, you know, if we're not doing it already, we definitely want to jump on board with this. So how did you convince people to be a part of this reaching out ministry team? Or how did you organize it? What were the thinking that we need to be thinking about? The biggest thing started with, and to be honest with you, I did this within ADOT, and I'm not joking, 4,300 people and 777 managers, and I was in charge of changing that engagement. So I had 63 countries represented within all of that. You've got different cultures, ways of communicating. I had to help people understand who they were themselves, and this is really getting organic with it. Not that we can do this this minute, but I started with personalities, and I worked with a colors personality testing, and I put all 4,300 people through that, and we, we ran it over a year and a half period and everyone got the understanding how I communicate and understanding how you communicate transcends everything else, whether you're from another country or not, but understanding the basic rules of that. And then started the leadership conference and within that, the mentoring program. It has to start with the leaders within the church. They have to be on the same page, doing the same thing, speaking from the same prayer book, if you will, you know, that we all sound the same, that we are all in this together, that we are pulling together. It can't look like the pastor does this and the head of SPRC does that and choir directors over here doing their thing. It has to perpetually do that. You have to pull it together with constant meetings, regular communication among the leadership within that and people that are spearheading communication. You can't have a church, you can't have any organization without someone that isn't in charge of inter that communication. You build in a communication plan around how you're going to communicate with that church. How are we going to get through this now? And what are we going to learn from it to do that? So A, it starts with the leaders pulling everybody together, agreeing on a, commun agreeing on a communication plan, and then agreeing on a training that's going to go on. And frankly, it has to go on just like this, where we're not sitting in front of each other and being a part of that and committing to that. And from that, you take that and start developing out mentoring programs to mentor more people into this group so that when the folks are out there on your Christ careers, they are still speaking from the same prayer book, that they are still talking about how we look at this. The culture of this church is this. Can you, any of you answer that? When you say the culture of your church is and fill in the blank, and ask how many people in your church and hear what they come back with. If that's not the same culture, then you might start looking at, people are pulling different things from this, but what is the overall culture of our church? I know why I go to that because this is the culture and I believe in that. I believe in not, not only the discipline, but all the rest of that, it's, it's the feeling that you get to do that. So it's, it's, like I said, it starts with the leaders, it starts with getting on the same page to do that and you do it ASAP, you agree on the communication plan, you agree on who's spearheading what, and you start the plan and the infrastructure from there. Thank you. So last question for you, it's, unless more pop up from the Q&A, um, because of your communications background, I've got to ask you, what's your perception, what's your advice, um, especially right now when we're having to share that, um, we're doing worship in a different way or we're connecting in a different way. You know, I've heard some announcements saying, um, so worship is closed, we're doing this instead, where other announcements are saying, hey, we're trying some different, we're gonna move to this direction or we're suspending worship for now and doing X, Y, Z. Do, we, do you have any tips or cautionary tales of using the specific languages like closed versus um, transitioning or postponed or, I mean, what do you recommend? That is an excellent question. And you are absolutely right. We, and especially today, you know, just like the president or anybody else standing in front of people, semantics is everything. Instead, what we're doing is, you know, our, our worship is flowering. Here's what we're getting ready to do. We are exploring new ways to do this because we really got down and really rolled up our sleeves and started looking at, wow, Matt, this actually gives us an opportunity to really connect even further. Start talking about those things as opposed to closed, not going to do it, suspended, terminated, don't touch. I mean, all those things, they're already hearing so much of that anyway, that kind of thing. You are 
a thousand percent correct. Our semantics is crucial within this to be able to keep saying how we're growing, how we're growing exponentially within this because we're now going to start reaching out and this is how we've gotten much better in the evangelistic area and how we're doing with people that are out there because we are now really getting in touch, in the real touch with each other and, and, and connecting our hearts because connecting our hearts cannot be separated or closed or suspended. It is that, it is pulling us together. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, so remember guys, if you have questions for Sherry or Bob or Tom or Nicholas is gonna start next, please type those in in the Q&A and we'll come back to those after this next segment. So because Nicholas is on a super tight schedule, um, instead of going to another uh, section where I'm sharing what we, I received via email, we're gonna go straight to Nicholas. Um, let's see here. So Nicholas, he's a licensed local pastor at First UMC Winslow and Holbrook UMC. Uh, so that's in Winslow and Holbrook, Arizona. I have to admit, I've never been to either one. I can only assume that they're small towns. So how are you able to connect with folks that, you know, you're, you're doing, how do you stay connected in a small community? It sounds like it would be really easy, like you just go to your neighbor's house, right? But uh, I'm sure there's different challenges that you're experiencing. So can you tell us about how you're continuing worship, Nicholas? You're still muted. Let me see if I can unmute you or... How about now? Yes. There we go. All right. Yeah, we are small towns. We're out here on the edge of the Colorado Plateau. And, and so one of the things we've done is create um, congregational care teams, kind of like what Sherry was describing, in that there, this, this network with a, a point person that is sharing information out from, from the church leadership team. But in terms of worship, like, like you said, our worship isn't suspended. Our worship is changing its form, but we are still worshiping. Um, so uh, kind of growing out of something that I had already been doing, because one of my churches does not have an accompanist, I had been burning music to a CD for that service. And when one of my parishioners went into a hospital um, for eight weeks, of a rehab hospital, and was missing that worship experience, I would bring the, the CDs to her after the service was over so that she could still have that worship experience. And I'd bring a bulletin along and a copy of my sermon. So I modified that some for our, our take home worship experience or, or a worship in a box. Um, and so I have that I pass out. Um, uh, and since Sunday will be the first time we're doing it, people will come by the church on Sunday morning and I will give them a CD, a worship outline, and a votive candle. Uh, the worship outline is something that I've put together. It's not quite a bulletin. It's more um, reading than a bulletin would involve. Um, and the critically important thing with the worship outline is that you are citing your sources. Err on the side of more citations than you would use in a bulletin, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, know that the, the key part is that you're giving credit where credit is due and that you're giving the resource that people can find and follow up if they wanted to read more from that author or, or, or whatever resource you're using. So I'm gonna share my screen here for a moment and show you what the um, worship outline looks like. So this is my worship outline for, sorry, for worship at home, outline A, and I actually have four different services. God, our solid rock is, is our theme. Here we, you see our citations highlighted here and here, and the citations are just at the bottom of the, of the page. Then I have, so during the prelude, they have something to reflect on and bring their, their heart to a worshipful space, because worship is not what gathering, worship is the attitude we bring to it. Then on the CD, it includes uh, the music for the hymns. Um, uh, you can lend out hymnals. You can make a copy of the hymnal page and include in your worship outline. And also the United Methodist, Methodist Publishing has granted temporary copyright permission for streaming and reproduction of 
parts of the Book of Worship as well as parts of the hymnal. And if you have a CCLI or one license, there are also reproductive permissions, so you can make copies and include that for congregational worship. Also, another resource in, in putting together your worship outline um, is hymnary.org, uh, and it has, a, it has scans of most pages, though not all, of our hymnal, and so you can just embed those image files into your worship outline. Um, I'm focusing on the Psalms in my, my take-home worship um, because I find the Psalms to be very comforting, which is something people need right now. Um, and so I'm also using Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina is Latin for divine reading, and it's a, it's a way of reading scripture in a prayerful, contemplative way. Um, then after, uh, I also include reflections. So these might be poems or a short story or something that can, the participants can read and reflect that is in conversation with scripture. And I find that to be a really um, important way for people to, to critically engage with um, the worship experience and not just receive it. And then I do have some reflection questions. What words in that reading do I particularly remember and why? And was the reading intended to have an effect on what I think, what I do, or what I believe? Because this is really the, the heart of worship what we think, what we say, what we do, what we believe should be changed in some way because of our worship experience. Um, so when it comes to the CDs, um, I, there's a couple of different options. Because I didn't have an accompanist, uh, my church went ahead and purchased the accompanying edition of the United Methodist Hymnal. Um, this is several hundred dollars and so may not be uh, the right resource. You could record your regular accompanist uh, on a smartphone or even using uh, Zoom. Um, that's how I recorded myself for audio clips on the CDs. If you start a meeting with no one else in it and record that meeting, when it saves the recording, it saves it as both a video file and an audio only file. And you can then import that audio only file into whatever other medium you're gonna use. For me, it was imported into the CDs. Um, Discipleship Ministries has a website of the piano accompaniment. Um, you can find that at umcdiscipleship.org and tab over to worship planning and then to music resources. And it has a list of over 400, almost 500 um, MP3 files that are of the hymnal as well as the faith we sing. And so you can include those music files um, and, and, and with, along with your worship outline to have a sung experience at worship at home. Um, for my own recordings, in addition to the worship music and a prelude that I recorded our accompanist playing, um, I, I recorded uh, an introduction or a welcome, uh, the, me saying, reading the scripture, me reading a prayer that people can pray along at home, and then an outro or a blessing, uh, a, a way of concluding the worship time together. The last thing I include in the, the worship at home uh, box is perhaps the most important, and that's this votive candle. I found these at um, big lots. They were a box of 12 for $7. So about, I don't know, it's 60 cents each. Um, but it transforms the space. It, instead of just listening to a CD at home or just listening to something like you would on the radio, it, it's a little thing, but it really moves it beyond just passively listening. It, it's a, in some ways, it's a ritual act that indicates both the presence of God and that we ourselves are fully present in that moment. And that's what makes it worship. Um, it's really that transformation more than anything else that makes it a meaningful um, worship experience. I decided that I was going to do four worship at home experiences and 
but only make 10 copies of each and rotate them among my uh, congregations so that I wasn't recreating 30 CDs or 40 CDs each week to pass out and that I could reuse them um, with, with each of the congregational care groups um, as, a, as a way of maximizing our, our resource usage and, and not, um, not wasting resources and, and burning half empty of CDs. So those were some of the things that I'm doing to create a worship at home experience uh, for my congregations where they can really experience, uh, experience worship, have a hymn, have a scripture, have a time of reflection, which isn't me listening. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, Tom, I notice you're unmuted, so I'm assuming you've got something. Go ahead. Yes, I just, Nicholas, I, I, my pen was not fast enough. What is the source that you use for the, for the hymns, for the MP3s? Yeah, so that's the, on the discipleship website, Discipleship Ministries, umcdiscipleship.org. If you click on worship planning and music resources, it's posted there on the front page of worship resources, um, this list of over 500 MP3s. Uh, that are in the hymnal and the, the faith we sing. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. And then um, a couple uh, logistical questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I just wanted to be clear because I'm not sure about the licensing and permissions for this part, so we may have to do some research. When you create your CDs, it's of your live performance, right? Your musician singing those hymns. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, then the second question is, are there any steps that you take for, I mean, if you're sharing this resource from house to house, and potentially somebody maybe sneezed on it or, or their hands have residue or whatever, what do you do to ensure that um, we're not just spreading the Holy Spirit among us, but <laughs> or that that's the one thing that we're spreading and, and not germs? <laughs> So the worship outlines, I'm not expecting to get back. That, the, that is a take home, leave it home. The, um, for the CDs, the, I just bought a hundred pack of paper CDs, uh, sleeves. And so wiping down the, the CDs when they come back, but throwing out and using new, new sleeves is the way that I'm minimizing that exposure. Fantastic. Okay, so I want to remind you guys, please be sure to put your questions in the Q&A so that our panelists can see them. I saw that there were some questions in the chat, uh, and then the chat moves, so then I, I lose track of the questions. So uh, let's give that a go. All right, so we're going to continue on. Um, there's some questions with I'm oh, sorry. There's uh, some information that Paul Cho shared. He's uh, the pastor at First Church. I don't remember what city he's at, um, but so here are the things that he shared that they're doing. Hi, Nicholas. Uh, so congregational care team, that's his number one. He's got a group of people that they call every church family each week to check in with them, share updates, ask if they have prayer requests, and provide a listening presence. So it's that back and forth, you know, not just outward communications, but receiving uh, the congregational care team forwards the prayers to the team leader for communication. Number two, and you know what? I'm going to share my screen. That might be help, more helpful. That's this guy. Okay, so the second thing is basic needs response team. A group of people are on standby. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, Stand by, purchase, drop off, or do other tasks for vulnerable church members. These volunteers use their cell phones and vehicles to run errands. Great. Number three, weekly newsletters, both by email and snail, snail mail. So it includes this week's happening, self-led worship liturgy for families or individuals, scripture and reflection, prayer requests from other church members. And then what he's got cooking in the works, but not quite developed just yet, is a spiritual formation shoebox kits, a shoebox filled with candle, finger labyrinth, prayer cards, scripture ribbons, and pre-labeled or stamped church pen pal. Uh, 
watch or listening parties, meeting our non-tech members in a safe, controlled environment to listen, watch online resources, and do worship together. So some of these uh, ideas, you know, we've heard some of these things before, but there's little bits and pieces here and there that, you know, like the finger labyrinth that maybe somebody else didn't think of. So if you're already doing this stuff, stay tuned, keep listening carefully. There's little nuances that you could use to make your experience that much better. All right, now we've got um, a little bit more from our North District churches. So St. Michael's UMC in Lake Havasu, uh, Pastor Carl Peterson is having a drive up service broadcast over the FM and a large screen to project image and video. Cool. Uh, Winslow UMC with Nicholas Granger. Oh, he already shared with us. Uh, so I'm gonna go to Journey UMC in Las Vegas. Uh, Susan Holden does pre-recording of individuals leading in different aspects of worship from their homes. Wow. The parts are edited into a single worship video, which is then posted for members to worship at home on Sunday morning. So it's just like if you had that in-person experience, you've got this volunteer sharing the mission moment, somebody else doing the scripture reading. So that's important. What I want to call your attention to for that piece is just like this webinar, too much of one person is too much of that one person. You know, breaking it up with having different people talking, occasionally sharing your screen, uh, that helps people stay engaged. And that's very important. When it's not an in-person experience, you have to explore, go beyond, do other things like the candle lighting. You know, engage people's senses, switch things up. Um, that's how you keep them uh, interested or paying attention. So Zion UMC in North Las Vegas, Linda Stanley shared that uh, she thinks preparing for a conference call, call in number for the congregants to call in to hear live audio worship. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, it's low tech and many in their congregation don't have the ability for internet. So that's low tech on both sides, people. I mean, there's really nothing to prepare other than making sure that the person giving the sermon is on that line and if it if they're calling in with a smartphone they could just have their phone in their pocket do the worship service uh wherever they're at and uh you know people will hear it over the phone and if you didn't know with zoom.us yes that is a somewhat techie response to a not online version but you could do the same thing for both so just like you guys are tuning in uh, and watching the video we could not in this webinar because I didn't set it up that way, but in a large group meeting uh, situation, you could have the one person on screen, so our online people see you and hear you, and then provide the phone number to listen in for our folks that are not online or don't want an internet experience. Um, so right now we're at 11.08. That is all the content we had to share. Uh, so we can open it up to more discussions. Any thoughts, panelists, on what you've heard and maybe something you want to add? I think a lot of great ideas. I certainly have heard a lot of wonderful things people are doing in the outlying areas. The important thing is to keep remembering that you want to go to the lowest common denominator from the aspect and really getting organic about how how you communicate because there are a great number of people that using any kind of technology the most technology they're using is picking up their phone and that's that's the best they get so starting with that i think surveys are really good but that also requires rather than mailing in doing an in-person kind of thing where they're again the, the christ career is dropping off information and picking it up again where there's that human connection to get that it's easy to just mail out something and how many you know you get one percent of it back it's easier in person dropping it off saying you care offering a prayer picking up the information and going back with it i would keep keep connecting people it's the thing that will keep bringing people back you know in uh, response to the the bishop's question about uh, networking with other denominations one of the things that we're doing in our drive-in worship is also uh, connecting with other folks in the neighborhood because many of the other churches have closed also and and don't offer the 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 one-on-one -on -one 
uh, live services. So we'll be connecting with uh, uh, other denominations, other churches, as, uh, as we can provide a live experience for them. In fact, this last week, we had a number of people that attended our worship because uh, they had gone to their church and the doors were closed. So they came over. And so we've been inviting uh, other churches, uh, people that want to have a live experience to come and, and park in a parking lot. I uh, really appreciate what Sherry had to share in terms of individual connection. And, uh, you know, for, for those of us who are doing something uh, with radio, um, that's really important to remember. And, you know, that if we do, you know, if the main worship experience is something that's kind of mass media-ish, then we need to also be doing something that's an individual contact so that we don't just rely on that. But yeah. Um, oh, and will the either the, the Q&A or the chat stream, I noticed that there was some good uh, like links and information, will those be available somehow after our gathering here? Thank you, Tom. Great segue. So what we're doing with all of this content, let's, let me share my screen real quick. Uh, not that one yet. Number one, uh, all of the videos from this webinar, the, yesterday's webinar, tomorrow's webinar, and then some next week's conversations, they're all, go, they're all initially posted on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash DSC communications. If you subscribe, then you will get an email notification as soon as a new video is on there. Then when I have time, uh, and I try, I'm really trying to, to keep these really low tech so that, um, let me move this over, so that uh, everybody has the information as soon as it's available. Uh, so once they're posted here, then I can go ahead and post them on our DSC UMC slash worship dash online website. So here's the links to all of those videos that you just saw on YouTube. And then I'll include the link to this video here, replacing this box. Click here to register for tomorrow's webinar. And here's the community discussion links for next week. Uh, then you can also find, I haven't done this part yet, but this is the next step. Uh, so on our Western Jurisdiction Facebook group called Online Worship, Online worship without any spaces or dashes. Uh, join this group, it's a closed group. So I'll be uploading the videos here and you'll see that there's these popular topics in posts. I'll also tag the videos. If it's a CCLI one, I'll tag it with this copyright licensing. So whatever you're looking for specifically, if you're looking for ways to collaborate, you click on that one and then it's gonna bring up whatever posts, and I had to click on the one with zero, sorry. It'll bring up the posts that um, are talking about that. If, if the person posted it using that uh, category or topic. Uh, so for today's chat, yesterday's chat, the next chats and Q and A's, all of those will be posted and linked in here. They'll be linked here. Uh, and what else? Mm, no, I think those are the only two. Um, but I'm uploading the raw footage into a Google Drive and then I'll just have the links to those available in each segment, if that makes sense. Um, go ahead. Sure, so the, the, the links that were posted in the Q&A and the chats will be in those categories. Yes, so the, the whole chat file, what it does, uh, Zoom creates a text file, so it doesn't look super pretty, and that's part of what's um, causing a delay for me right now. I've been, I, I really wanna ha make sure you guys have the easiest and best information at your fingertips. It's really hard to go through that chat file to find what you're looking for. So I've been debating um, in between this other stuff whether I just share the file the way it is or um, try to clean it up and format it in a way that's a little bit easier to, to find what you're looking for. Um, Christina, yeah. given yeah. the, I can't even begin to imagine what you have to deal with. Uh, <laughs> so 
if it's easier for you at this point just to just to post the raw file please don't you know we can navigate through that so yeah. you're right you're right i will do that and then maybe as as we have time i'll try to clean up some stuff but that's that's a better better plan thank you tom um, so we're at 11.15, and at this point, we've got 31 participants and including myself, four panelists. I hope this was an enriching time for everyone. Uh, I know that there's some topics that do overlap some, which is why we have those conversations scheduled next week that touch a little more. It's a deeper dive into these conversations that we've been having yesterday, today, and that we'll have tomorrow. Uh, so there may be some repeat of information, sure. But just like in these examples, you know, there's little nuances that might make a world of a difference. I encourage you to visit that dscumc.org slash worship dash online page and register to attend these um, webinars and conversations. Bob, did you have something to add? Well, I am learning to be a little bit more computer. I wanted to share the, uh, um, the screen of our uh, marketing for our drive-in worship. Did that show up? Did it? Okay. So, and then we boosted that out on Facebook also, so uh, we can get a larger number of, of folks that uh, can see it and attend. I'm so glad you shared that, Bob, because that brings up a new uh, question, a new thought. Um, so if you have something that you want to learn more about, you'd love to have a conversation about this. Maybe you feel like, hey, I was struggling with something, but I learned a good way to do this. Um, for example, the Facebook advertising. Do you pay to boost? Do you, are there's Google ads that you can do for free? There's all sorts of stuff like that, that especially right now in this time where people can't just go to their usual, well, I go to this location on Sunday to meet my people, to hear the sermon and be enriched. You know, there's different steps. We need to think about this whole thing in so many different ways. So perhaps we need a conversation about marketing. Um, and, and if you guys are interested, we'll host another webinar or a discussion about it. Um, but you can do that. Let me know what your interests are, what, you know, what, what haven't we covered. I'm gonna share my screen one more time to show you this button. Oh, yay, of course I removed the button. So I guess you can't ask me. <laughs> no, uh, I'll put the button back on, it'll be here. It's um, an ask a question button. All it does is link to my email address. So I will add that in the chat. But uh, the easier one to remember is communications at dscumc.org. Uh, and that'll get to me as well. And then uh, I'll organize another one. And I appreciate everyone's thoughts and prayers about the crazy amount of work that communication is, is under right now. We're in this just like you guys, uh, pastors, church leaders, we're all scrambling right now. And I'm not alone. I'm uh, leaning heavily on my um, directors of communications uh, in the rest of the Western jurisdiction. There's a lot of people that um, signed on yesterday that might be on today that are from other jurisdictions. You know, we need to keep those, that collaboration going. And um, uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, thank you. Somebody typed in my, the communications email address. Yay. All right. So that's all we've got today. It's 1119. We didn't go over our two hours. Yay. Um, hope to see you guys tomorrow. Um, have a blessed day.